Okay, so welcome everybody. It's so great to see you here celebrating Arbor Day all month long with uh, our Canal Forest Restoration Project. Today's presentation is going to be, um, you know, Robert and myself um, will be presenting kind of a very brief five to 10 minute recap of some recent progress with our Canal Forest Restoration Project before moving on to the main event that you're probably most excited to hear about, which is the past, present, and future of SUNY Oswego Centennial Arboretum um, with Kate Spector and John Mills. Um, so this will be uh, a, a short beginning and then moving on to the Arboretum. Um, I should let Robert actually chime in with our housekeeping notes if he is uh, happy to do so. Go ahead, Robert. <laughs> Of course. Um, so just a few things before we get started here. Uh, for those of you who are online, um, if you're not the person speaking, just please remember to mute yourself. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We can get to those at the end um, or just hold them and you can ask them um, verbally. Uh, don't forget, we do have two more talks lined up for um, the rest of the last two Fridays in April, the 22nd and I'm pretty sure the 29th. Um, the, our next talk next Friday is going to be from a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, so if that interests you, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, and just also remember that we are recording these talks. Uh, so if you missed it um, or you'd like to review, you can watch those um, at your own leisure. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say, Dr. Haynes, if you want to begin. All right. Thanks, Robert. Um... Okay, so we just want to start with SUNY Oswego's land acknowledgement. So I'll just read this out for all of us. Um, our institution starts a lot of events this way, just as a way of honoring the Native peoples on whose land we are, uh, you know, actively living and working. Um, the State of New York, the State University of New York at Oswego would like to recognize with respect the Onondaga Nation, the people of the hills, or central firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands SUNY Oswego now stands. Please join SUNY Oswego in acknowledging the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations, their elders, both past and present, as well as the future seven generations to come. Consistent with the university's values of diversity and equity, inclusion and social justice, this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to cultivating relationships with Native American communities through academic collaborations, partnerships, historical recognitions and community service in order to dismantle the legacies of conquest and colonization. Um, so just a, a quick little note about our project for those um, many of you are probably familiar, so I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief. Um, this map on the left shows New York State's canal region. A lot of us think only of the Erie Canal, but there were actually a lot of offshoot canals connecting up with it. Um, kind of the Finger Lake section, Champlain section, and our Oswego Canal that we probably are all familiar with. Um, our project is focused on uh, cultivating, distributing, and educating people about a few key tree species that um, the canal industry had a big impact on. These are uh, oaks in the white oak family, white pines, and some other species like black tupelo that we'll talk about. Um, why did they have this impact? If we look over here, we can see a lovely canal boat a whole bunch of lumber. <laughs> Not only was the canal used to transport lumber, but boat building, like a lot of aspects of the canal, like building our boats, building docks, building barrels, building locks. We recently learned that there's these coin posts that are this like really important structural element of a lock. Almost all of that would have been made out of oak wood, oaks of the white oak family, because these are super strong and they do not pass water. Like the structure of the wood is such that water does not pass from one end to the other. It's really interesting. Even red oaks, they will not do that. They'll let water through. So they're watertight. They're great for boats. They're great for furniture. They're great for many things. So that's why we do not really see many white oaks on our landscape. Um, and yet they have such important habitat benefits. They're such an important native tree. 
So that's why we have a very strong focus on the white oaks. White pines um, were used for trim work, masts on the canal schooners. There were sailing boats on the canal that could pop up their sail, go across open water, pop it back down to go under bridges. Um, and black tupelo is one species that is a wetland loving species and a lot of wetlands were drained to create it now. So that's why, you know, for now we're focusing on this handful of species. We're collecting seeds. It's a very grassroots effort that many of you have been involved in helping us gather seeds, plant them, transplant the seedlings, give them away. So that's what we're all about. Um, this is our team. Uh, Professor Kamal Mohammed um, first brought on the project um, to SUNY SDO. It was started by these two individuals, George and Jane Pauk, who learned about this legacy of trees and the canal and just were very inspired to start this project on their own, um, just by going and gathering seeds and convincing They've been so great at convincing other people to help. Um, they ended up distributing trees on this historic canal schooner through the whole length of Erie Canal, which is amazing. Um, they talked to Kamal, we took on the project, and we've uh, developed relationships with some other groups, including this individual, Steve Frost, who has his own tree growing and giveaway operation down in Trumansburg, super cool. And he's invented kind of his own uh, growing system that we've adopted to a large extent. Um, and Robert here is our uh, intern. He's been with the project almost a full year and we're so grateful for all of his help and his, uh, his, uh, his many contributions, both you know, toward like every aspect of the project. So we're, we're so grateful to have had Robert on board and he is leaving us for graduate school next year and we wish him all the best with that next endeavor. And I'll turn it over to Robert to talk about some of our stats. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Haynes. Uh, so digging into the, log the logistics um, of the past year, uh, first we're gonna dive into uh, the tree giveaways. Um, so in 2020, we gave away 113 trees. Uh, in this past season, we've given away over 300, uh, which is an amazing improvement uh, and we hope to see those numbers continue to climb. Uh, so most of the trees that we've given away include English oaks, uh, and like Dr. Haynes said, our focus is really on the white oaks. Uh, so we give away a lot of white oaks, swamp white oaks, and bur oaks, which are all um, in the white oak family. Um, we've given away all of our large white pine trees, uh, but luckily we have a new batch of wonderful looking uh, pine trees ready to give away uh, this season. So we're very excited about that. Um, so all in all, from this chart, we can see a pretty significant increase uh, of trees given away um, compared to last year. And again, we hope to see uh, those numbers continue to climb. Uh, so now looking at trees given away by counties, uh, Oswego County ranked number one. Most of our trees uh, resided in Oswego County uh, with 218 trees. Uh, and in total, we reached 10 counties, uh, which is around the same number. Uh, as past years as well. And we were actually able to attend some outreach events uh, last year, which was awesome, including um, Beaver Lake Nature Center's Golden Harvest Festival uh, and an event at the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse, New York. And it was really great to be able to experience uh, the Golden Harvest Festival, especially, and meet many people with, uh, with a restoration mind, uh, mindset. And everyone was very interested in our project there. In total, I talked to over 120 people um, and gave away all of the trees that I had brought there and sparked a lot of interest in our project. Um, so it was a really successful event. Uh, and we're looking forward to returning to the Golden Harvest Festival and expanding um, to other places like the Chittenango uh, Landing Boat Museum uh, in the near future. And so some even better news, uh, we had successful germination uh, with our new tree species, the black tupelo, uh, which Dr. Haynes uh, introduced earlier. And it's a species that is native to our area. Um, and the one that we hope to incorporate into our tree giveaways uh, within the next few years.
And so we also held a volunteer transplant uh, in the fall where a few volunteers from the community uh, and a couple students from the school as well helped to transplant our sapling white oaks and English oaks from their germination buckets into, um, into their own container. So you can see in this picture on the bottom here, that's all of us, these big white buckets um, and the blue buckets are what we had the plants in. And then we transplanted them into their individual um, black uh, containers. And so we had over 400 new white oak uh, and English oak trees, as well as bur oak and swamp white oaks are ready for giveaway. Uh, um, in total, we have about 700 trees uh, that are ready for new homes next year. So now moving on to our seed planting, we actually just started planting our um, new generation of trees a couple weeks ago. And we really had a successful collecting season this year, thanks to George and Jane, uh, who provided a lot of our white oak acorns, uh, which was probably close to 2000, if not more, uh, which was amazing. Uh, and from the seeds we planted inside, uh, we have already seen great germination rates uh, from those. We also had a few swamp white oak trees uh, and bur oak trees on the campus uh, of SUNY Oswego that produce an ample amount of uh, acorns that we planted and will hopefully produce several dozen trees uh, from those. Uh, and as I talked about earlier, uh, our black tuplo seeds are doing great. Uh, we have wonderful germination from those. That was very surprising. We're very happy to see that. Um, and by collecting pine cones from white pine trees right outside the field station doors, uh, we were able to plant over 2,000 very high quality uh, white pine seeds. So um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So in all, all in all, we've planted close to 5,000 seeds this year. Uh, and so even if half of those trees uh, germinate and survive, uh, we'll have a lot of trees to give away uh, within the next coming years. And then here are just some photos of the uh, germination, the black tupelos on the left here, uh, and a bunch of our uh, white oaks on the right. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Haynes to finish out the presentation. Okay, not to steal any thunder from uh, Kate and John, but I do wanna mention that uh, we're super pleased that um, two trees that we grew through this project have ended up um, in SUNY Oswego's newly revitalized Arboretum. So one was um, a, a small bur oak that looked very similar to this. That wasn't the exact tree. Um, gets to quite a beautiful, huge, long-lived tree. Um, and also a white oak. And it started off like kind of looking like that. So we, we were really happy um, to be able to provide a couple trees to that project. I uh, want to provide a little update from our partner, Steve Frost, down in Trumansburg. So um, he had a couple issues with uh, Mother Nature over the past few years. 2020, white oaks weren't masting that year. Unfortunately, they, they'll produce a big crop only every you know handful of years. So he, he went ahead and purchased acorns that he then gave away in the 2021 season. But he developed this great partnership, the Finger Lakes Land Trust, um, and gave them over like about 500 oaks, um, bare root uh, oaks to plant across the Finger Lakes region, which is really wonderful. Um, he did note that there was a spongy moth outbreak that was really bad in the Trumansburg area, um, probably the worst that some folks down there had ever seen. Um, so that meant another bad year for acorns in 2021 because, um, you know, the spongy moth defoliated the leaves, the trees put out new leaves, but that took a lot of energy, energy that meant they weren't really producing acorns this year. Um, but he still gathered a lot and he wanted to know that he became an oak grandpa this year, that one of the trees he planted from seed, it was actually a cool hybrid tree, produce acorns this year for the first time. So I think that's very inspiring, I think, to a lot of us who you plant a tree from seed and sometimes you think like, well, I'll never see this when it's big, but um, you know, it, it is possible to see the fruits of your labor. So I think that was a really cool update. Um, 
Steve had a move actually to Rochester and ended up dealing with a whole new pest in his compost area, um, rats. So now he's dealing with rats and, and it makes me feel very grateful that we do not deal with rats out at our compost um, or anything like that. So hopefully he has luck with that in the coming year. Um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and um, I also would be remiss not to give a huge thank you to George and Jane, not only for providing those acorns, but for all the support they give to this project. They are our founders, they had the vision for this project, and they continue to support it in so many ways. So thank you, George and Jane, and thank you for our volunteers, all those who've donated, all those who've planted a tree. Um, we're making this happen, and we're getting a lot of trees on the landscape. Right. Um, and with that, uh, I will turn this over to Kate Spector and John Mills, both from the Office of Sustainability here on campus. Thanks, Christine. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Haynes, uh, both for that wonderful uh, presentation and for inviting us to be here today. Uh, my name is Kate Spector. I'm John Mills. And we both work in the Office of Sustainability here at SUNY Oswego. Uh, and today we're stoked to tell you about the 1961 Centennial Arboretum, both in terms of its history, the current efforts, and where we are hoping to go in the future. All right, so quick overview, um, really kind of mirrors the title, right? We wanna dive into the history, you know, what's the story with this? Where did this project come from? Who was involved? Uh, talk for a minute about what we're doing right now. And then of course, our big plans for the future. All right, so let's uh, talk about where the Arboretum is. Uh, this is a, a image which displays uh, the campus map. Uh, the Arboretum is indicated with that pink dot over there. It's on the easternmost boundary of our campus um, and also wonderfully placed right next to the Office of Sustainability, so we get to enjoy it every day. Um, if you're driving around town, it's located at the corner of 6th Avenue and Washington Boulevard. So when we started on this revitalization campaign, we really didn't know too much about the Arboretum. All we knew is that we had trees at the site and then we had a bronze plaque that is currently on the Sixth Avenue facing side of Moreland Hall that has a long list of donors that contributed to this Arboretum. So we had some information about the Arboretum, but we really didn't know who else was involved in this project. So in, we relied heavily on the campus archives at Penfield um, and as well as um, Post Standard and Vivian Pines uh, newspaper databases. And through those that research, we were able to find that in April of 1961, we found that a Centennial Tree Fund Committee was formed in the city of Oswego under the advisement of Mayor Ralph Shapiro. And this committee really wanted to honor the centennial year of uh, SUNY Oswego, which was also in 1961. And they wanted to come up with some sort of a gift to you know, really honor the connection between the town and the campus at that moment. So within four months, they were able to actually acquire all of those donations, set up a, the bronze plaque to be made. And then those donations were then presented to Dr. Uh, Foster Brown um, of Studio Suigo at the time by Mayor Ralph Shapiro at Frederick Lane Elementary School. And then we see two years later, a bulk of those trees were then planted in the Arboretum in 1963. So during this time in campus, we saw the campus nearly triple in size. It expanded massively westward. Moreland Hall, Lanus, Mackin, and Shelton in 1961 was centrally located in campus. So the Arboretum was very centrally located in campus at the time. And then when we saw this huge expansion of the campus, that central location shifted. So the Arboretum kind of, we saw it kind of get lost in the shuffle. So then in 2020, um, a couple of groups of like-minded individuals wanted to come together to start this revitalization campaign. Did we know we had a Centennial Arboretum on campus and how did that kind of come about? So then since that committee's forming, we then last semester planted nearly doubled the amount of trees that were currently on the site, as well as sought some other um, avenues to continue the permanence of the Arboretum on campus. So going into a little bit of the history of the Arboretum, during 1961 um, was the centennial year. So 
the Oswego Normal School was founded in 1861 by Edward Austin Sheldon, who had a huge emphasis on object-based learning, was also a known horticulturist through the building of Shady Shores, the families living there, they built a fabulous homestead, and really um, prioritized the connection of the campus community and the site of SUNY Oswego at the time, really wanted to strengthen that connection. So during the centennial year, we saw there was tons of different events and programming. The Arboretum donation was really one of the last things that happened during the centennial year. So we saw tons of different events, performances by campus groups, such as the Catalina Club, which was our water aerobics team at the time, <laughs> um, as well as many other speeches from across the town. There was also architecture tours on campus and in the city. Like I said, many buildings were being added on campus, so architecture tours were prevalent and just really honored the lasting contributions made between the college and the community. Also during the centennial year, a logo was made and the um, theme of that year was a century of service to education. And this logo was designed by Professor Robert Sullins, who was professor at Harvard at the time. So then moving back towards the Centennial Arboretum, it was one of the last things that occurred during the Centennial celebration year. Um, 75 donors in total contributed to this donation, it included local businesses such as Rabies, local gardening clubs, the Men's and Women's Gardening Club of the Suigo donated, and as well as a slew of other individual donors. And they came up with $2,000 in total to donate to this Arboretum. And I just want to point out that Dr. J. Anshan Miller, who was a professor of biology at the time, assisted with the advisory of the tree procurement for the Arboretum as well as the placement for the Arboretum. And I just really want to hit on the fact of how important this emphasis was of the campus and the community at the time and just how grateful the campus was to receive this donation from the community. So this is a quote by Dr. Foster Brown on just the monetary gift of the Arboretum. He states how wonderful then the community should extend its thoughtfulness to include the college for not only will the trees enhance the campus setting and conserve its soil, but it'll also provide an arboretum and living laboratory for the study of nature. All right, so what are we doing now? Uh, as John pointed out, you know, there's a lengthy history and it's been absolutely wonderful to revive that history, understand why this arbor arboretum came to be and really continue the work and to fulfill the mission. Um, so yeah, we planted a whole bunch of trees in the fall, 21 total. Uh, we worked within our committee, we invited some student volunteers. Uh, the grounds crew uh, from SUNY Oswego has been wonderfully supportive in terms of our efforts there. Um, and again, our pur purpose of our efforts, we're really just looking to reestablish the site, modernize the mission and make sure that this project doesn't get lost. So our mission, Pretty simple, but working from what we know about the previous mission, we're trying to honor our commitments to our natural resources and preserve them for future generations. This is particularly relevant during a time of climate change. We know that trees can help us to mitigate the awful effects of climate change. And we are working diligently to ensure that the Arboretum performs some of those functions for us and also demonstrates those functions to the students we have on campus. So our committee is composed uh, primarily of uh, individuals from three distinct groups. Uh, John and I serve on the committee, so we represent uh, the Office of Sustainability. Uh, likewise, we work with alongside Dr. Haynes and some other folks from Rice Creek. Um, and we have this wonderful group in the city of Oswego, the Oswego Tree Stewards, who bust their tails to take good care of the trees that we have in the city of Oswego. Um, we're all like-minded individuals, and we found that working together, we can get an awful lot done. And of course, we're looking for new members. So if you're interested, please reach out. We'd love to have you. So we formed our committee, and then we needed to basically go into the site and assess what was already there. We already decided we wanted to add new trees to location. So in the site already previously, we found a number of white pines, Colorado blue spruces, um, silver red and sugar maples, as well as a dawn redwood, a hawthorn, and a handful of other trees that were currently already there. It was roughly around 25. So in choosing our new sites for our new trees, we sought a lot of advisement through Rice Creek for the specific tree species that we would um, then 
put into our site. And we really wanted to prioritize trees that we knew would maybe adapt to the changing climate, the changing landscape in Oswego. So we chose trees that primarily, this is their northernmost distribution spot in their native range. So we anticipate that these trees, their distribution range will continue to move up northern as the climate continues to change, as the landscape change. So we really are thinking ahead with these tree decisions and hoping that these trees then migrate upwards in their distribution range. We also looked at factors such as edibility. We decided to plant two new fruit bearing trees in the Arboretum and we really wanted to have students be able to go in, eat, see fruit, see something recognizable that they could pick. So the barrier to enter the Arboretum was gone. They see something recognizable in the space. All of our trees are now labeled. So there isn't that barrier of, I don't know what this tree is. I now can read that this tree is familiarize myself with that location. And we also wanted to support the aesthetics of the Arboretum. We have a great fall season up here. So we really wanted to find foliage of trees that we really enjoyed as well, and just continue to support the um, diversity on campus as well. We chose 21 different tree species, and we haven't had those trees present on campus already, so that really, we hope, will up the diversity on campus of our tree stock. And just for the presentation's sake, we have about 45 trees in the Arboretum currently, and I broke them down into three distinct sections, um, starting with our original trees that we know were planted in about 1963, maybe decades afterwards, um, as well as our edible tree varieties, such as pawpaw and serviceberry, and then our trees that we primarily looked at for their climate resiliency. Um, and I just want to state, uh, we did put that the pawpaw and serviceberry are edible in fruit bearing qualities, but the other trees on this list have medicinal qualities, serve other yields and purposes that might not be seen as edible fruiting, but for this reason, we just considered that characteristic for these three trees. So we're going to go in and break down the trees from each of these um, categories. All right, so a deep dive into a few select species. Uh, the Dawn Redwood, a very unique addition in this area, and this is original, um, original to the Arboretum in 1961. Uh, worth noting, this tree was thought to be completely extinct until about the 1940s when it was discovered in China. Um, at that point and upon that discovery, there was a global effort to replant um, across the globe. Um, this is a big one, can get up to 100 feet, but in the world of sequoias, pretty small for a sequoia. Uh, really likes full sun and lots of room to grow, uh, prefers moist, deep, well-drained soils. Uh, and again, this was one of our originals uh, to the Arboretum. The pawpaw, I'll throw it out there. This is my absolute favorite. I have a lot to say about it. Uh, so the pawpaw is really, um, I would consider a treasure, a national treasure and somewhat of a forgotten treasure. Um, an understory tree doesn't get too big, maybe 25 feet. I suppose it could push 40 feet in a good natural setting. Uh, really likes full sun. Um, it has big leaves, and because of those big leaves, it's not very wind tolerant. Uh, so sometimes with young pawpaws, folks start them on the edge of a forest to keep them protected and then move them out into full sun conditions. Um, in full sun conditions, they will bear lots of fruit, uh, and anything less than that, they will bear less fruit. Uh, pollination is a little goofy with the pawpaw. Uh, traditionally in natural settings, you see the pollination occur as a function of flies and beetles. Uh, this can be done by hand with a paintbrush, um, but it does involve two uh, distinct, uh, genetically distinct species uh, to make that happen. Um, again, as John was saying about the native range, Oswego is the tippy top of the northernmost range. So as climate change uh, worsens and it gets warmer around here, we expect pawpaws to really be very comfortable in this zone. Um, one of the biggest fruits that's produced uh, in uh, in the United States, uh, tropical like, uh, and people really like it. Uh, one of the catches with the pawpaw is that fruit cannot travel well to the grocery store. So you will never see the pawpaw at a grocery store. If you're lucky, you will find puree in the frozen food section. Um, historically worth noting that both Presidents Washington and Jefferson were particularly fond of the pawpaw and did have pawpaw orchards. Um, and a couple of popular cult culture references. Uh, if you ever watch The Jungle Book and the song Bare Necessities, they do refer to the pawpaw. Likewise, Pete Seeger's got a great song, Pawpaw Patch, and I might recommend that you uh, give that a listen. 
Um, there's also a Paw Paw Festival. Actually, there's several Paw Paw Festivals, but uh, one that I've been to and is absolutely worth going to is the Ohio Paw Paw Festival that happens every year in the middle of September. The Kentucky coffee tree. Um, I think one of the really exciting things about the Kentucky coffee tree is it's very versatile. Uh, it gets along in most uh, soil conditions. Um, and again, it back to what John was saying about northernmost ranges, you know, by by putting this in the Arboretum, uh, we're putting the Arboretum in a good place to adapt well as uh, we see warmer and warmer temperatures. Um, and it does have a foreseen tolerance to uh, polluted environments, so works really well in urban settings. Um, this is worth noting. So it's called the coffee tree for a reason because it can serve as a coffee substitute. However, the raw seeds are highly toxic. It's thought that the roasting process can uh, quell any of those potential toxic effects. Um, and this is a new addition to our arboretum. So our committee planted these trees and then we found ourselves in the question of, well, what's next? Do we continue to plant trees every semester? Now there's now a maintenance portion of these trees that needs to happen. So do we meet regularly? What do we do now as a committee? Um, and we really needed some mechanisms in place to have that structure, provide that structure for how do we have a maintenance schedule? When do we want to plant trees? Like, characteristics to planting trees. So we pursued accreditation through ARBNET and ARBNET is an international database of Arboretum uh, maintained by the Morton Arboretum outside of Chicago. And they it promote advances in conservation, collections on scientific study and education regarding trees within their network. Um, and then we recently were received this level one accreditation in March um, for our Arboretum. So with that, we needed to meet criteria such as having 25 trees in our inventory, having a standing committee that meets regularly, discusses the Arboretum, having maintenance strategies and policies, and then having an actual inventory of all of our trees with labels as well. And this just ensures certifying our Arboretum puts in, uh, ensures our longevity of our Arboretum, makes it permanent. And then it just foresees those continued improvements of our arboretum. And we currently have this accreditation for about five years. And at, at those five year points, we can choose to renew our level one accreditation or we can pursue a higher level within ARPNET and they go up to four levels of accreditation within their um, service. service excuse me. So then that goes right into our future vision of what we plan on to do in the arboretum. And like I said, we do plan on receiving and we do plan on submitting for level two accreditation within five years so with that become comes the criteria of now we need a hundred trees in our arboretum inventory we now need a comprehensive tree care plan that can be implemented throughout campus for all of our trees we need an arboretum employee or at least someone that has in their description to maintenance the arboretum um, come into conversations with our committee, provide us with some clarity on some decisions we want to be making, um, enhance educational and public programming in, in the terms of an Arbor Day observance, um, um, collaborating with K-12 schools in the area, laboratories on campus as well. And then we also will need a documented collections policy, which essentially is just, we prioritize local nurseries when we procure our trees. So just formalizing and writing all of that down who we try to look at when we want to procure new trees, what characteristics we look at when we procure new trees, and essentially how we document and label all of our trees and what information we prioritize. Another thing we see in the future is pursuing a Tree Campus USA designation. Um, it does a couple of things for us. One of the biggest things it does for our campus is it raises the visibility of our commitment to natural resources. Uh, and that high visibility really will lend itself uh, beautifully to students uh, understanding the importance of taking good care of our natural resources. Um, likewise, uh, for this application, there's a lot of really beautiful overlap with the efforts we've already expended to pursue the accreditation through ARBNET. Uh, so there's five pieces required of that application. Um, tree advisory committee, great, we formed one. We, we already have a leg up in that direction. Uh, developing, identifying, and articulating a campus tree care plan. Um, likewise, we need to verify uh, expenditures associated with the maintenance care, uh, maintenance and care of trees on our campus. Uh, observing Arbor Day, you know, again, that's something we're doing. That's something that's already going on, already in place. And, uh, 
you know, will lend itself really well to pursue all of this Tree Campus USA designation. Um, and the last component of the application is creating an associated service learning project. Um, at SUNY Oswego, we do an awful lot of service learning projects, and I think that will be a really beautiful connection uh, to make with students. Uh, worth noting, uh, thinking back to our committee, when I talked to you a little bit about who is on our committee, the Oswego Tree Stewards are on our committee. And the Oswego Tree Stewards, through their work in the city of Oswego, have uh, earned the designation for the city of Oswego uh, as a Tree City USA. Very similar programs, one's for a city, one's for a campus. So we have a component, or I should say a section of our committee that's already gone through this process with the city of Oswego. And certainly those previous efforts will lend themselves beautifully to our pursual of this designation. So moving forward, like I said in the beginning, for a lot of the history of the Arboretum that we have and a lot of unknowns, we relied a lot on the campus archives as well as these uh, newspaper databases. And going through this presentation, Kate and I came across some of the questions of, well, what if someone later on wants to pursue this as well, find out more about the Arboretum, is curious to see our work we're currently doing. Um, and we really wanted to start submitting some of the things that in the committee that we've started working on to the campus archives, some of our sketches that we draw when we go out and want to start where we want to plant a tree, um, meeting minutes, um, as well as just some brainstorming activities that we go through. All of this is important for the future to provide clarity for what we were, our decisions were during this moment for informed decision-making for the future. Okay, our committee made this decision for this tree at this moment. Maybe then add another one of these varieties 20 years down the road, as well as just it continues the work of the Arboretum, continuing having people looking into the information. And we really just want to support the campus archives as well. So a few other events that our Office of Sustainability is hosting um, the rest of this month, two Fridays from now, after the last Arbor Day webinar series on Arbor Day, <laughs> there will be an Arbor Day observance in the Arboretum. <laughs> in the Arboretum, um, we will be um, providing tours for some of the trees that we have there. There will be we're going to be planting some new trees as well as the Canal Forest Restoration Project will be there, giving away some of the trees that they have been um, growing here. Um, and we'll have some light refreshments as well. And then the following morning, we will have a maple brunch in Cooper Dining Hall from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And one of the recent initiatives our office has taken up is tapping the sugar maples on our campus. This is the second year we've been able to do that. And so all of the sap we collect is collected on campus and it will also boil down into syrup on campus. So it's a completely on-campus new initiative that we're really excited and really proud of. About. So we hope to see all of you at either of these two events. Certainly, if you have any interest in getting involved, whether it's finding out a little bit more about our work, you know, getting your hands dirty in the Arboretum, maybe rolling up your sleeves with the committee, we'd absolutely love uh, to have you. So please, my email address is right there, katherine.spector at oswego.edu. Feel free to reach out, out to me. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, a big thank you to Dr. Haynes uh, and Robert and Rice Creek for hosting this series and inviting us here today. Thank you. We do have time for questions and I'll call up um, our chat too so we can pull questions from both crowds. So thank you so much, thank Kate you. and John. And feel free to stay up here with okay. me. I'm sure you will have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I guess first, I think we did have a question from our audience here, maybe? Maybe not. Okay. You know, I, I saw that you were going to expand to, uh, it might have been one of the requirements to 100 trees. It, uh, can you duplicate trees and you have to have, you know, each 100 has to be a different species of tree? So they don't need to be different species. It's just a total, grand total that are considered in our Arboretum of 100. So we have so many trees on campus that aren't in our Arboretum. So just trees that are that are characterized in our Arboretum and labeled as such, that are labeled, I'm sure they just don't need to be. They all don't so are the trees on campus are considered part of the... They could be. So I guess there's two ways we can go with that. We could either expand the boundary of the Arboretum 
and or we could increase the density of the arboretum. And I suppose we might choose a happy medium between those two. Because we're definitely almost at capacity for trees in the actual site of the original arboretum. So we've considered possibly expanding throughout campus and you know having the campus be in Tree Campus USA kind of reaches that distinction of having the campus be considered entirely in arboretum. I mean, that is the goal in the long run, really. I know there's, I'm going way back now in my time at campus school, but the space between Hewitt and Culkin, I believe some of the trees in the long are still there, had some special significance at some time, whether they were in memory of someone or some kind of special tree. If you haven't checked that out, I that's so there. that's really interesting because our office used to be over in Hewitt, mm -hmm. and as John said, we started our maple syrup project two years ago. And we started our maple syrup project with those sugar maples. Yeah. Um, I think there might be 30-ish sugar maples mm -hmm. down there, and it's interesting that you mentioned that they might have a bigger significance I, that I'm not familiar so, with, but, but I'll dig into that. that. That's interesting. I'll talk about 70s thousand. Okay. Uh, but I remember them being. There was something about those trees. We were pretty much allowed to all over campus and did all kinds of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. campus school. I remember something special about those trees. And then they, of course, they moved the Sheldon statue there when they renovated Sheldon. Okay. And then they moved it back. And okay. There was, some, there was something about them. I remember the blacks or something, but it's probably all along. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no. Thank you for letting us know about that. Next time we get done with the archives, we'll kind okay. of poke around a little bit. Thank you. You know who taught our Audrey Hurley is still in town and she taught at the campus mm -hmm. school then because Kate, my daughter Kate, sure. at the campus school. She was and she's still around. So she might know about that because the campus school kids were taken over there from Sweatman. Yeah, she, she might remember why they were taken. Sure. She was at the very end of the campus school. I think. Oh, okay. And she was towards the very end, so I'm not sure. Yeah, and I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But I, I, we were the last eighth grade class, the seven and seventy six, and we were Ellie Filburn. Oh yes, yes, yes. Ellie Yeah, we were pretty much free range. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have any any questions from our our Zoom attendees? about either project, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it or use the chat. Can I ask a question about the tree giveaway? Uh, are there, like some of the species, and I'm not sure if you're planting like swamp oaks, I mean, do they have to be planted in a wet, you know, they have to have wet feet or, or something to that effect, or, you know, the, the white oaks, or white oaks easily planted in, in um, you know, drier, like a city type of environment? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll come over here. So I'm on the camera. So um, good question. Like, how do you know which trees to plant in which situation we have? like half a dozen tree species we give away. And, you know, our project is happy to talk with individuals about, you know, where they are intending to plant a tree and what, what might be the best option. Um, some of ours specifically do very well in urban settings, like as urban street trees or, or otherwise urban trees. And, and a lot of trees don't do well in that kind of scenario. So um, our black tupelo, our swamp white oak, our burr oak, those all do great in cities. Um, white oak, white pine, those tend to do better if you have uh, like a, a larger open area, not right next to a street or anything like that. Um, and, and certain different like site or soil conditions might determine what exactly you select, but um, there should be a little something for everybody depending on uh, your situation. So um, we certainly are happy to chat with folks about what makes sense for them. Yeah. Uh, I'm just yeah, having a comment, sure. you know, this program was really so well done, uh, it could go just as is, like, to other places in town, to a cop, to, I was thinking, high school, or, I mean, it's just, 
I learned a lot and I have been involved a little bit with so knowing what's going on, but I learned a lot and I thought it was just very well organized, as was yours. You know, I think these two programs could use a larger audience, you know, when when you have time with people. <laughs> No, I think that's a really good point. And I think that's kind of why we do our work because we're hoping there's going to be some copycats, you know, and I think even thinking back a little bit to Arbnet and Morton Arboretum, that's why they do what they do, you know, so they can really lead the way with best practices and, and make something that people can cut, copy and paste. And in our work, as John was saying, you know, it's just, you know, you're excited about doing things and you got a lot of hands and the framework has been wonderful and it's been very productive. We we have a, a question um, from Kathy or Ron Sipling or both. Um, are you using the reverse osmosis process for maple syrup? That's a really great question. Um, so as we said, we're in the second year of this project, um, and we went really kind of low tech for now. We're pretty small scale. Last year we collected 80 gallons of sap. This year about 160 gallons of sap. Um, so no, we're not using reverse osmosis yet, um, but I would really love to uh, expand our scale and likewise also expand our, um, you know, our sophistication in terms of how we're, we're managing this. But we work with the folks at Auxiliary Services uh, and they manage the boil for us using the equipment that they have. Okay, what's the ratio? Uh, 40 to 1. It'll be 35 to 1 on a good day. So that's the ratio of sap, sap to syrup. syrup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that means you've got about four gallons. Of, yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, it's a you know, it really is amazing. It's one of nature's wonders. You know, if if you've never um, tapped a maple tree and and just had that sap break from the tree, boy, is that great. Um, you know, and it's it's something anyone can do with some diligence and hard work. Um, and all it requires is you know a pot and a fire. And then a lot of time, maybe 24 hours. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have students that are participating in this? Absolutely. Um, in fact, the bulk of the work that happens in my office happens uh, using student interns. Um, and that just works out so beautifully. You know, they get to uh, get their hands wet with all sorts of different projects. You know, this is just one of the things that we do in the Office of Sustainability. Well, I suppose I should say too. Um, you know, so we have students uh, who come to us from all different uh, fields of study, um, you know, and they help us to advance campus sustainability and likewise, uh, they get some really neat experience and figure out some things about what they like and what they don't like and where they want to head in the future. Wonderful. Looks like, well, I'm sure we're, the three of us are happy to stick around and answer questions or, or folks on Zoom are welcome to email us. Before we totally um, disband, I want to give a quick shout out here to, oops, um, gotta move this aside, to our speaker next week, who is uh, Dr. Douglas Ptolemy, um, he is a professor in, at University of Delaware, and he's also a New York Times bestselling author. It is amazing that he has agreed to come and speak uh, through this program. He wrote The Nature of Oaks, which just came out in the past year or two, and it's like made, made a big splash among, you know, the community of people interested in, in gardening and environmental issues and trees, and it's all about um, how oaks really sustain more native uh, wildlife from insect diversity on up than any other native tree we have, um, which is so great working so well with our project here with the Canal Forest Restoration Project. This is going to be phenomenal and we hope you will join. We hope you will spread word um, because it's it's so amazing that Dr. Ptolemy um, will be here next week on Earth Day. Um, he will be here or on Zoom? He will be here with us in spirit. <laughs> he, will be, he will be on Zoom. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he'll be with us in spirit on Earth Day. So this is, this is going to be um, 
Wonderful. And of course, the Office of Sustainability has things going on all next week, too. Um, if you follow them on Oz Sustainability on Instagram, you can learn all about what's going on. Um, so I want to sincerely thank everybody who joined us today in person and over Zoom. Um, thank you for caring about trees. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and we hope we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.